Yeah, throw some, throw some questions from the side. Hey, good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Cool. I saw that we had a lot of uh, writers, directors, and actors, uh, a lot of hyphenates. Well, that's really good. I'm a hyphenate. I'm a writer, director, producer. I'll just give you a little bit of background on me first. Um, I am uh, a product of film school. I went to USC film school through the 80s. And then uh, after that, I went into the indie film world. I've navigated through... Uh, um, different uh, aspects of the business. I worked in children's television, documentary films, network uh, TV shows, uh, indie TV shows, all across the boards. Um, but I always seem to come back to indie filmmaking because it's where I can make the films that I want to make. Usually the ones that are harder to make, harder to get released, um, and harder to get out there, but they're the passion projects. The film I'm going to talk about tonight is a unique independent film. It's called Break. It's a contained thriller and it was one of the the best experiences of my career because it straddled that world of art and commerce. We all work in the film business. There's two words. There's film and business. And Break was sort of this art house movie that was this commercial thriller. So what I'd like to do just because a lot of you probably haven't seen it, probably none of you have seen it maybe, Matt's baby see it, um, is uh, I'm going to run just a, a few minutes, maybe four or five minutes of the uh, BTS that's on the, uh, the DVD, give you a sense of the production a little bit and some clips, and then we'll talk a little more about it after that. The shooting uh, schedule for break was very unique. The schedule itself was 12 days. And I remember uh, talking to my manager at the time, and I, I said, I'm shooting this movie, I'm producing. He's like, oh, great, 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 you know. And I said, uh, I'm, you know, it's, it's gonna take 12 days to shoot. And he just kind of paused, and he's like, you're gonna shoot a movie in 12 days. Okay. He came to me and said he had a movie that he wanted to try to do in two weeks. I probably wouldn't have gone for it if it wasn't for uh, the trust that I have uh, having worked with Gabe for so many years. Really kind of the biggest challenge when we were in pre-production was finding this, this stage space. We couldn't afford a studio lot space and we couldn't afford to have separate detached offices. We had to find a really unique space that would lend itself to a production and secondly, had close by office space that we could use for our department heads and for our production office. Yeah, I mean basically we were in a little warehouse in the valley, uh, Burbank, and. The Crown Vic cut in half um, with a real trunk. I decided that the best approach would be to make sure that how I shot it, how I rewrote it, how we cut it and did the sound design was always from the perspective of the character in the trunk. It was going to be an immersion experience that the audience would be in the trunk of that car with the main character. So in any shot, in any decision making of where to put the camera, what to see, what to hear, we would never give the audience any more information than the main character has in the trunk. The point of view of the audience is the shared point of view of the main character. So that was kind of my mantra going into it. <laughs> One of the ways that we um, uh, got the actor to be thrown around in the, uh, inside the car, sort of like a pinball in an arcade, was to uh, actually hard mount the cameras onto the car, and the production designer, John Mott, came up with a, a great way to uh, actually uh, put the car in motion. The solution I came up with was cutting the car in half, and adding basically an oar or a large pole to the front of the car where a bunch of guys, a bunch of a group of people would then wiggle that oar and it would give the impression that the car was moving. And so the car would go up and down, it would go left to right, it could be slammed forward and that would throw the actor around in the box in a realistic manner. And, uh, and that was actually causing uh, the actor to uh, bounce around uh, you know, non-stop and it, it really got uh, quite violent but he always asked for more. He always wanted it to be more violent. I was worried about the cameras. 
one of the things we talked about at the beginning, Gabe and I, uh, was how to make the set more interesting visually through the journey of the movie. I said that I really needed this set to be completely unique because we were going to be there for almost the entire movie. The fact that the film takes place in one very small confined space was a challenge, but I felt it was uh, exciting. It was, uh, especially as it's not just in the trunk, which I think really, for me, was the added bonus. The, the, the thing that made it different from being, you know, we're just gonna be in the trunk. We're actually in a prison in the trunk. And so that, to me, was the bit that I grabbed hold of. But I knew I wanted it to have more of a confining feel to it. And so I said, let's, let's put big steel pieces and bolts and, and cross braces and things all through it so that I could move the camera uh, through it and shoot through these things and they would be foreground elements and they would feel like bars, like prison bars that are keeping him inside. That was one of the stars of the movie too, is that box. I think that box is a, uh, a coffee table now in somebody's office. So the thing I wanted to do tonight was talk about the you know anatomy of a, of a contained thriller because one of the things when you're working in the independent film space and the low budget film space is how do I make a really big movie with a little amount of money and how do I make sure that that movie makes its money back? So when I got together with these fledgling producers, this was done by uh, two first time producers um, who approached me about doing a, a film with them. I said, if you guys want to do this, you want to make a movie for a few hundred thousand dollars, um, you got to find the right script. So that's number one in, in breaking down why Break was successful. It was made for $500,000, and it went into really great profit territory. It was released theatrically by IFC Films um, domestically, um, and then uh, by Lightning Entertainment around the world. So it played theatrically in different countries, and it became this little success story. But really, it began with picking a movie that could be done realistically in that time period. So when you, you're thinking about making a film like, like uh, this, you, a lot of considerations. One is the genre. What's, what's a genre that's going to make money? Thrillers, horror films, that kind of stuff. So if you're thinking from a commerce standpoint, you pick uh, a genre like that. Um, and then that wasn't all I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that was artistic. So when I got the script for Break and saw that the entire script of this movie took place in the trunk of a car, I found that to be a really great visual challenge. But it also said to me, we can do this movie in 12 days. And we shot this entire feature film in 12 days. So, but I wouldn't say any movie can be shot in 12 days. You got to pick the right script. It has to have a contained space. And this was an incredibly unique contained space, as you saw our production designer talking about. And since it was this sort of unique piece of, of cinema, I was able to attract really good actors. We got Tom Berenger, Stephen Dorff, who plays the lead, because you're able to go to them and say, I have this incredibly interesting character in an incredibly interesting movie. You're not going to get paid a lot, but I'm only going to take up two weeks of your time, and you're going to get to play this really cool character. And they'll say yes. They'll take scale. They'll take less than their rate because it's something different than they get to do. And it's up to you as the filmmaker to pitch them on this and tell them you're gonna take them on an incredible ride and have a blast doing it, and they're gonna do something they're gonna be proud of even though they're not gonna get a big paycheck. And if, if you give them points and it turns out like break, they end up with a big paycheck anyway, right? Um, so that's another thing to consider is when you pick the material that you're gonna do, pick something that's gonna attract actors because in order for it to be profitable, you're going to need those actors to, uh, to sell the movie. Okay? So that was part of our, our consideration with, with making Break, too. Um, the other thing that was great about Break was, since it was a unique thing, we were able to get a lot of really, really interesting people on board. People who usually work on big studio films came to do this, this little film because it was interesting. The score, uh, for example, was done by a composer named Brian Tyler who does a lot of the Marvel movies and bigger films. Um, really great composer. Um, and he saw the unique and interesting idea of a contained thriller in the trunk of a car. And we talked a little bit about it. And he said, 
you know, I, you know, he, he usually does these big scores, conducts the London Symphony Orchestra, all that. He's like, this is one guy in a car. I'm going to do a contained score. And I said, well, I don't want any brass or woodwinds, just like percussion and strings and things that are like, like an automobile, you know, kind of. And he's like, I got it, I got it. And he basically did a one-man score. He locked himself in his studio with all the instruments, played them himself, mixed it himself, and then went out and recorded like car parts and stuff that weaved into the score. So this unique little movie inspired one of my collaborators to create this, this unique score that went on to become a very sort of iconic piece of his filmography. Um, likewise, Stephen had done a movie called uh, um, Somewhere with Sofia Coppola. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw that, but he'd, he'd gotten to work with a sound designer named Richard Beggs, who had done the sound design on Apocalypse Now, won the Oscar for that, did all these different uh, uh, movies for, for Coppola. And he's like, you should get Richard Beggs to do this. And I'm like, Richard Beggs isn't going to do this little movie and stuff. He's like, no, no, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. So Richard Beggs came to our editing room and watched the movie. And he was, he was so interested in the idea of creating an immersive soundtrack um, you know, that the world existed in the 5.1 world outside of this car that he took on the project for, you know, a fraction of what he usually does because he was in between other, other films. But we got to, to collaborate and get this incredibly unique sound design. Again, because the material attracted the talent. So that's, that's something I want to always emphasize is that if your material is good and it's unique and it has something to say as a filmmaker, um, you'll, get, you'll get people involved as actors, sound designers, composers, um, editors. All these people are going to be, be your collaborators. Um, one of the other things about making a, a, an indie film like this um, is the collaborators, right? If you're a director, um, you want to take in all those ideas. You want to take in great ideas and you have your great collaborators. Being a director on a film like this or, or any film is not always about just being the guy in charge or calling the shots. All of that's part of it, but it's about learning to work with your collaborators. Because film is one of the most collaborative art forms there is. It is a collaborative art form. It, it, it's not, I don't follow the auteur theory of French cinema. It's like everybody on my sets are filmmakers. They just have a speciality. You know, Brian, the composer, who's a friend of mine, is a great filmmaker. First thing I do is give him the script, and we talk about the script, and he's like, here, change this, try this, and we kick script notes back and forth. Same with my DP or my editor. We all sit with the script, and I take ideas from them. Because ultimately, um, I remember this vividly from film school. It was a director-writer by the name of John Milius. You guys know who John Milius is? Okay. Wrote Apocalypse Now, directed the Conan movies. He came to our, my film school and he was sitting there and he's like, he's talking to a bunch of us over a beer after he came to show a movie. And he said, uh, he's like, he's like, take in everybody's good ideas. You know why? Because it's going to say directed by Gabe Torres on the screen. So you might as well use everybody's good ideas. Don't shut people down. And I have never forgotten that. So that's one bit of wisdom I'll pass on to y'all. And part of, of the success of Break was all those great ideas from these, these wonderful collaborators. The uh, finishing the movie and getting it sold is, uh, is something else that you're going to have to do. So when you finish the movie, back when we did Break, this, this isn't a recent film. So that was like, you know, I've done a few films since then. This was uh, released in 2012. Um, but just then, the, the distribution models were, were changing. And now it's just blown out with the streamers and everything. But um, back then, you know, the theatrical model was starting to collapse a little bit and we were getting something called day and date which everyone was like kind of scared of you know they were going to like release movies through your cable through on demand a week before it opened in theaters and everyone's like that's going to be crazy but break was one of the first movies to do that and we actually opened um like in march of 2012 through like uh time warner and spectrum and whatever and it got purchase we made like you know a few hundred thousand dollars that first weekend that way and then it would say like it would come up on your tv and would say see it before it's in theaters and people were like into that and it kind of laid the groundwork for this and then when it was in theaters it's like it would say see it while it's in theaters and we were opened in you know big markets like new york chicago 
LA and a, a few other cities around the country, but people in rural areas could experience the same art house kind of films um, that uh, the big city folks could. So it was a big hit that way and then continued that and then did everything else. Nowadays, if you're making your um, indie film, you have a lot of different avenues to get it out there, not just theatrical. Theatrical becomes kind of like the accent now, you know, unless it's a studio picture. You're going to go through Amazon, you're going to go through Hulu, you're going to sell it, you know, um, through to Netflix maybe if you make the film and, and sell it right off to Netflix or Amazon. So these are, there's so many ways to get your indie film out there. But again, they're going to pick this thing up if the script is good and if the final product is good and if you've pulled together the right team to make that film. Um, part of, some of you are here about shorts, you know, and shorts are a, a really interesting way into it. You know, making a short, it can be as, as passionate as, as making a, uh, an, an indie feature. Um, and a lot of that, that same mentality applies in terms of the platforms that you can get your shorts out um, today. Steven and I talked about that when I rewrote the script. We did uh, the Jeremy character in that film is uh, has problems. He's a uh, he's a Secret Service agent. The, the plot is this: he's a Secret Service agent. He wakes up in a blank space and it's dark and he doesn't know where he is. And he turns out to be in the trunk of a car and he's been kidnapped and he has gambling issues and debts and he's been compromised and they've kidnapped him and they're holding his wife hostage and torturing her and they want the location of the president's bunker um, that they can get out of him. And he has to survive this, this thing and it's moving all over the place. The car is continually in motion and spoiler alert that he learns that the car itself is filled with explosives and the car and he are gonna detonate at the president's um, location when they get there. So there's a countdown constantly going on and the terrorists are playing games with him in the trunk of the car. And so Jeremy's arc is that he goes from not knowing where the hell I am to, oh shit, I've got problems here because they want this out of me, and then trying not to be broken. So break is a double entendre. They're trying to break him, and it's also breaks of the car, so there's a, a double meaning to that. So we played with that arc, um, and then visually, since we're in this contained space, I tried to let the space tell us what was going on in the, the character's mind. So in the beginning, when you don't know, he doesn't know where he is, um, you just see him in a black void and there's this red light and there's a clock above him. Then when the car starts moving, light leaks in and you kind of define the space in the trunk of the car because now he can. And then as he starts to go more and more insane through the torture and things that are happening to him, the car gets shot up and run into, the lights don't work as well, they have lights in there and they're flickering and things are hanging and damaged because his mind is going astray. So I use the visual nature of the contained space to help tell us about the character's arc, not say it, show it, because film is, is visual, you know? It's like I always say like, you know, when we do these kind of movies or any kind of film, you wanna tell it with the images rather than the words because you know it's like you don't write the script and then stick it on the seats in the movie theater and everyone comes in and sits down and reads it. it's not a radio play right it's it's moving images on the screen we were very fortunate because of this one location and because of the fact that um, we didn't have to move around to a lot of different locations we were able to have the luxury of shooting um, in sequence and the actor was in that in that box every day in that set piece that you saw there. And we did some other stuff for him. All the other actors, we had all these other great actors playing voices who you don't see. Um, we brought them in live and Steven never met any of them. And they were put in a, in a booth and he, the voices would be pumped in and he would improv with them and do different things uh, with him. And then, and then he'd never know who it was except for people who he knew you know, uh, famous actors like, you know, Tom Berenger. And so, yeah, so we had no distribution plan before the m we made the movie. We just said, these young producers are like, let's make a movie. We got some money and you've got, you know, we found this script that entices you and you've got a way to do it. Let's do it. When we finished it, we actually used a sales agent. And I would recommend anyone who has a, uh, an indie film to find a good agent. And they put together these test screenings of it and they invite all the distributors to it. And then they all, I watched it happen, they all see each other in the room, you know? 
Um, and then they start saying, oh, you know, so-and-so here is from IFC, and these people are here from, from this company. And then they start bidding against each other, and, and IFC won. Um, so I would, I would really urge anyone who's trying to get distribution not to send out screeners or a link, but you know, get a little screening room like Matt's got here, bring everyone into one, and, and have the communal experience of showing the movie. That's gold. Break is available. I think it's still on Amazon and Netflix. And, and uh, if you can find a DVD and buy it on, on uh, eBay or something, it's got a lot of great extras. It's got Brian talking about the score. And they made a real sort of cinephile DVD with lots of really cool extras in about a 25-minute uh, behind the scenes that uh, there was this great little documentary filmmaker had made. But yeah, so I'd say get the DVD or Blu-ray. Steven, I I'd known Steven since he was about 12. And, and so um, that wasn't really the, the reason, um, but uh, we'd been in touch and I kind of played to his ego, you know? Um, I said, uh, hey, you know, there's this great little movie I'm doing, would you be interested? And we tried to work together over the years because we'd been friends and it never worked out. And, uh, and I said, hey, you know, why don't you read it? You're gonna be the only guy on screen for the entire movie. <laughs> and it's all you, dude. And he's like, I'll read it. And he called me up, he's like, how are you gonna do this? And I said, well, come on over, I'll show you. And then we sat down, I walked him through it, and he's like, all right, all right, I'll do this, this is cool. And then there was this Ryan Reynolds movie floating around at the same time called Buried. And Steven's like, shit, I can, I can act circles around Ryan Reynolds, you know, that kind of thing. He was, he was kind of, it, it, not that cocky, but he was, he was very competitive with that movie um, and, and uh, thought that our premise was, was a lot cooler and a lot better than, than that one. So I think that the idea of, of besting that premise and being at the heart of a contained thriller um, with a character as unique as Jeremy. And again, it goes back to the character was really well constructed. It had flaws and, and, and stuff. And then, you know, he had other really good actors to play off of, like, like Tom Berenger was in the movie and Kyler Lee, who's on Supergirl. And, and we had a lot of really wonderful people. So, but uh, I think my time is up. Is it not? Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of your night.